Good morning. Thank you all for coming today and for your interest in our story. Uh, I'd like to say a few words and then open the floor to your questions. While it is an honor to have been nominated for the award, it is not mine alone. The honor belongs to every man who fought at Vehicle Patrol Base Kaler, especially to those who made the ultimate sacrifice, allowing the rest of us to return home. I have an absolute responsibility to tell our story because there are nine men who cannot, and it is their names that you should know. Specialist Sergio Abad, Corporal Jonathan Ayers, Corporal Jason Bogar, First Lieutenant Jonathan Brostrom, Sergeant Israel Garcia, Corporal Jason Hovader, Corporal Matthew Phillips, Corporal Pruitt Rainey, and Corporal Gunnar Zwilling. We all answered the call and Chosen Company became our family. We were dedicated to each other. The life of the man next to you was more important than your own, which was most greatly exemplified by the following. I reflect on the courage displayed that day and I am in awe of the men I served with. Corporal Bogar only stopped returning fire to treat casualties, myself included. Lieutenant Brosham and Corporal Hovader braved direct enemy fire to reinforce OP topside and axed Sergeant Stammerum, Sergeant Garcia, Specialist Denton, and Specialist Soans would repeat. Sergeant Chavez was shot through both legs as he helped pull a mortally wounded Specialist Abad to cover. Corporal Ayers was struck in the helmet by an enemy round and continued to man a machine gun until the end because we needed it. Specialist Scantlin moved around the battlefield, treating casualties after all the medics had been wounded. Captain Seifel and Chief Hill landed their medevac helicopter between OP topside and the enemy. Sergeant Kinney departed that bird to help casualties. Private First Class Krupa, Specialist Hamby, Sergeant Santiago, and many others returned fire from gun trucks despite accurate incoming RPG fire, which destroyed the tow missile truck, and there is so much more. I view the Medal of Honor as an award given to an individual that represents our collective efforts. Valor was everywhere, and we carried the day together. To me, the medal represents the sacrifices of our team and all service members, and it is a memorial to all those who have laid down their lives for our country. I owe it to them to live a life worthy of their sacrifice. I would now like to take your questions. Thank you. You mentioned uh, that these, these men who served with you um, were your family, or you felt that they were your family. Why is that so? Combat creates bonds um, like I've never seen before. And after 14 months in combat, we just got to know each other so well. We could tell who we were. We could tell our friends in the dark just by the way that they walked. And we're ready to lay down our lives for each other. Um, honored to meet you. The, uh, is this with you all the time? I mean, uh, obviously you're no longer in the service. You're living, I guess, what we would call a civilian life now. Uh, is it with you all the time? Can you move beyond it? Or do you even want to not stop thinking about it? Or how does it stay with you in your life? I've thought about it every day since July 13th. Um, I don't want to forget about it. I think I've learned to manage it. But I take comfort somehow in the, in the pain of that loss because it reminds me that they meant something to me and I never want to forget that. And I, I appreciate the sacrifice that they made for us. Sergeant, we've, we've seen the descriptions of the action that day. I, I'm interested in what was going on in your, in your mind. How do, you, how do you prepare yourself mentally for that kind of a situation? And, and what's the thought process as you're, as you're experiencing it? I don't, I don't know as if there's much to mentally prepare yourself beyond the training um, and the bonds that we have. Going through my head that day was just that I needed to do what needed to be done, just like every other man. Everybody was doing what they could to impact the battle uh, because of what was needed. Hi, Sergeant. Can you talk a little bit about uh, life today and what you've been up to since that time? Uh, I 
graduated college from the University of New Hampshire um, last spring. I have a one-year-old son, uh, two-year wedding anniversary coming up next month. Um, so that's, and there's a lot of guys that that's the path they followed. Um, you know, it's great to look around and see my friends coming home and, and enjoying their lives. Uh, and there's a lot that have, there are many that have continued to serve. Um, and I have a lot of respect for that. You were hit in your chest, both legs and an arm. Tell us first what the pain was like and how you found the ability to go on. There wasn't any pain at first. Uh, it was just shock. And when I crawled to the southern fighting position and saw Bogar returning fire and Rainey and everybody else running around doing what needed to be done, and the volume of fire coming in um, that I just, for me, I just knew I had to participate. I had to do what I could to help out. I couldn't just sit there and let them uh, bear the burden. Doug, your face really lit up when you talked about your one-year-old son. Would you be okay if he entered the military? I want that to be his decision. I'll be very proud if he chooses. I would, I would love that. But I want him to follow his own path. I hope that he believes and understands that, you know, as an American, he has a duty to defend his country. But I'll be happy with whatever path he follows as long as it, it's making him happy. The um, place where you were stationed in Afghanistan, um, it sounded like the most remote, dangerous spot on the earth you know, from some of the descriptions that I read. Do you ever, in being out of the military for this short period of time now, do you ever think back to the importance of the mission and question it in any way, the, the mission in Afghanistan? No, I've never, I've never questioned the mission. Um, you know, my mission is to, was to defend our country and execute our commander's intent and I'm, I'm comfortable with that. All right. There was also that dramatic um, moment in the story where one of your comrades is dying. Most of us have just seen that in the movies. Uh, somebody's mortally wounded, they're lying there, and they're actually able to talk and to tell somebody to convey a message. Could you describe that again, if you don't mind? It was Sergeant Israel Garcia. He was severely wounded, and I remember very clearly. It was, it was all I could do to comfort him was to just, I, there wasn't anything we could do for him uh, other than for me to give him the guarantee that I would come home and tell his wife and mom that he loved him, and he was thinking of them in his last moments. I know you were injured as well. Were you aware of how badly you were hurt while you were trying to fight back? And would you mind speaking to the efforts of the men that came to help aid you afterwards? I uh, wasn't certain of how serious my injuries were. Uh, I knew we wanted to get a tourniquet on my right leg. Bogar put that on my right leg just because I, the worry, the concern that I might have hit a major blood vessel. Um, but. Lieutenant Brostrom and Corporal Hovader, they really did brave direct enemy fire. They ran through the center of the village to reinforce the OP. Uh, and I honestly don't know how, that they, how they made it. And then even later when, you know, a number of men had already been killed and wounded at the OP, Sergeant Sam, Sergeant Garcia, Denton and so still came. And even after that, after that wave was wounded, there were more guys towards the end of my time there before I was medevaced that guys were just pouring up to the OP um, to reinforce and, and do what they could. Uh, to people who haven't heard specifically what, what occurred that day, can you describe the sequence of event and what went through your mind as events unfolded? 
Um, from the, I mean, honestly, it's a blur from the beginning of the, the fight, from that opening burst to, to being wounded. Um, you know, it was just every man fighting with everything they had. And then finally, the, the Apaches, um, our first platoon, was able to get there. And, um, you know, the tide seemed to, to start to turn. And uh, please describe your reaction when you heard that you were, you were, be, you were to be honored with a, with a Medal of Honor. Um, when I first heard it, uh, that it had been upgraded a number of years ago, I wasn't happy about it. Um, never felt that I deserved it. But since then, I, I've you know, accepted the fact that this isn't mine. And it belongs to everybody who was there that day, because we did it together. I didn't do anything more than anybody else. There was a report that there were some soldiers who were reprimanded that were actually part of this, uh, that were under attack. Is there truth to that? Was, was it that the military revised their opinion of what went down that day? Those letters of reprimand were rescinded um, for Colonel William Oslin and uh, Major Matt Meyer. And I have complete confidence in their leadership ability, and I would follow them anywhere. The United States is pulling out of Afghanistan. And I'm sure you read the papers and you know that we've pulled out of Iraq, and now that country is, is headed towards civil war. Do you worry? that that might happen in Afghanistan? And if, if you had the ear of the president, what would you tell him to do? Those are certainly questions probably better directed to the, the Department of Defense. Uh, you know, I was at the tactical level, and uh, those things weren't really things that I thought about. It's an easy question, but a hard question. Were you ever scared? I know for myself, and I would probably venture to say this is the same for many other soldiers and, and service members, that my two biggest fears were always that I would let down my buddies or that one of them would be hurt. I, I would say that day wasn't any different. Uh, first, Lee Zeman, Sergeant, what's your son's name? Uh, my son's name is Lucas. Lucas. Is that L-U-C-A-S or K-A-S? Uh, C-U. C-A-S, yeah. Secondly, how have you changed since 2008, since July 2008? I don't know as if I have that much. I've just... I think the, the biggest thing that's changed is I know that I've been given a gift and I think I have an appreciation of life that I probably didn't have before and know now that I'm going to live my life for those that aren't here because I owe it to them. They gave me this gift and I'm not going to waste it. You walked up here pretty well. Are there any lingering injuries? Do you play full court basketball or ski in the winter? Uh, I try to stay away from running. It's not, that's not great, but um, for the most part, I'm I'm good. But you know, I have a lot of friends, and there are a lot of other service members that have injuries that are far more serious than mine. Um, so I, I try to keep that in mind. What's it like to get a phone call at your house from the president? It was, uh, I, I, I still don't know what to think. It was, it doesn't seem real. I don't remember much of what he said. I just remember me saying, thank you, Mr. President. Yes, sir, a whole bunch. Okay, you have a good day too, sir. <laughs> so that's, that's pretty much all I remember. Did you have any advance warning that he was gonna call? I did. Oh, you did, yeah. What time of the day was it, I'm curious? It was the morning. Morning? Yeah. So I'm, you're going down in July. Have you, have you been to the White House before? I have. Last month I was uh, fortunate enough to attend Kyle White, 
Kyle White's Medal of Honor uh, ceremony. He was in Chosen Company 1st Platoon. Um, this is, I'm from the Lowell Sun, um, John Collins, and I understand you went to South Egan High School too, so might have ran into you 10 years ago when you were in school still. But um, do you have Lowell ties? Did, did you grow up there? You heard you were a um, Lowell native? Or? I grew up there very briefly. I don't really have any, any ties there. Yeah. Kind of claim New Hampshire as home. Mont Vernon? Yep. Yeah. Sergeant, you've joined a, a very exclusive club. Have you heard from any of the other members? And, and what are the lessons that they're trying to teach you about how to carry this, this medal? I've spoken to um, you know, Kyle White, because he's a friend, um, and another recipient. And um, just trying to keep in mind, just take it a day at a time, and realize that there, there are responsibilities that, that accompany the award. What are those responsibilities? To represent service members and tell our story, tell the story of the men that I was with, um, to honor the award. You know, you never want to bring any sort of disgrace on the award. You're, you're a man of few words, right, Ryan? <laughs> Mostly. Are you, are you kind of dreading having to retell this for the rest of your life? Because, I mean, this is, as we noted, it, it's so few people have received this honor, and, and yet here you are, and you, like, you didn't ask for it, but now until you're an elderly man, you'll be asked to retell that story. I'm not dreading it, I guess. I appreciate the opportunity to tell our story. And it's probably what I want to do most. But it's also the thing that's the most difficult to do. Sergeant, why did you join the Army? I didn't know what I wanted to do after high school. Had always wanted to serve, but got caught up in high school with the things that adolescent teenage boys get caught up in. And, um, you know, when it came time to really start thinking about what I wanted to do, I thought the military was, you know, a great way to serve my country and, and figure it out. And uh, I've never regretted it. Another part, a uh, story I read, one of my colleagues in the Globe read a great, wrote, wrote a great story. Uh, cooking grenades, that's when you pull the pin and wait a few seconds before you throw it so that they can't throw it back. How do you practice that? I mean, is that something that you did for the first time in battle, or was that that good out to happen? Uh, that was the first time I ever did it in in combat with a live grenade. Um, <clears throat> I had actually practiced it in basic training, went through a grenade training course, um, and that's where I first learned about it. And that was, day, it a li was it a live grenade in practice? No. Okay. It was a, uh, it was a dummy grenade. Yeah. How many times did you do that in the firefight? Um, at least three, probably more. Did, um, at any point in the retelling of the story, people must ask you, how many of the enemy did you get? I mean, personally, is that something that you would know? No. No. I, I no idea. Yeah. Primarily, you were calling in reinforcements, too, while you were under fire? I, I was relaying information to uh, Major Meyer, who was our company commander at the time, Cap Meyer at the time. Um, is, is there anybody else that was in the fight that is also deserving the Medal of Honor in your, your mind? I mean, that, that's something that my, I wasn't nominated for it originally. My commanders have, you know, that decision was never mine. Um, you know, I, like I said, I don't think of this as mine, it belongs to us. 
we earned it together. Probably more just a technical question, but how did the battle end? Did the Taliban forces retreat or were they destroyed? Did you guys end up getting evacuated? Can you, can you tell us about that? I was evacuated before the end of the battle, but they eventually withdrew and, and they were pursued, um, you know, both by soldiers and uh, aircraft. I know you mentioned that it was a blur, but do you remember what the night was like before you saw the enemies come out? It seemed like any other night. It was quiet. Um, the only thing different about that morning was that the locals didn't come out to the fields to work. Uh, that was probably about the only thing that, that seemed different and odd. How many other battles um, did you do in your 14 months? And I guess this was your last day, and then you were going to ship out. Could you, could you tell me about that? And was it how do you feel about that? Was it ironic? Did you ever think that was going to happen? Yeah, it wasn't my last day. That was probably within the last three weeks uh, of our deployment. Um, but it's one of those things. There's no pause in combat. You know, you're not done until you leave the country. And I, we were okay. I mean, we're, I'm okay with that. How many other battles have you been in your 14 months? I don't, well, more than one. Um, but that was the nature of that area. You know, our company wasn't the only one that saw a fight, you know, Battle Company, which has been in you know, the movie Restrepo and upcoming Korangal, and our Able Company, every company saw fighting. Uh, you know, so we weren't alone in that. And you know, we certainly weren't the only ones to see fierce fighting. I think every unit did. You know, every company lost a soldier. Uh, for me, my injuries, I, I knew that I couldn't perform at the level that I would want to. That was kind of it for me. If you could have, would, would you have? Yes, I would have. I, uh, I love the military. It was, it was the greatest thing I've ever done in my life. And it was the honor of my lifetime to serve with those guys. And I would do it all again. From the initial onset of the battle, uh, I was wounded in the opening volley of RPGs and, and hand grenades that came into the OP. Um, you know, really, at that time, I was a little shell shocked, and you know, the other guys that weren't, like Rainey and Ayers and McKeg and, and Bogar, are continuing to fight, and then I finally moved to the southern position and, and got a little bit of treatment. And then um, after Stafford came there and said that Zwilling and Phillips had been killed. Uh, and he thought that they were throwing hand grenades that I thought, you know, if they're, throwing, if they're within, if we are within hand grenade range for them, they're within hand grenade range for us. Um, and so then I moved back out and, and really, you know, from that point on, I was just trying to do, keep up with what everybody else was doing. That's, that's what motivated me. That's why I really don't think that I did anything differently than anybody else. The, the most serious injuries were to my, my right leg, took shrapnel, um, peppered all over my right leg, my backside, some to my left leg, left Achilles, um, left hip, left arm, and I took a little bit of shrapnel in my forehead, but it was mainly superficial. And say with you, you're fully recuperated from those physical injuries? Or? I would say I'm fully recuperated. They did a, a phenomenal job um, at Walter Reed, putting us back together and so many other service members uh, that it's 
it's amazing. Did you think you were going to die? When I realized I was alone, I, I thought I was going to die. I thought it was my time. Um, but my biggest concern is that I knew that I didn't want to be taken alive. I was only there for an hour and a half to two hours, uh, but it went well on after that. Could you describe that one and a half, two hours as the most defining moment of your life? I would say so. And, and the way that I've, I've processed it and just, you know, what I saw the guys do. Um, you know, I guess whenever I'm having a, a tough day and I think things are hard, I just try and think of what everybody went through that day and then the guys who don't get to have tough days anymore. So I try not to, try not to complain. At any point in the battle when you were under fire, did, did you hearken back to anything that you were taught in training from a particular commanding officer, a piece of advice maybe that helped you in that time? Consciously, no, but it's there. I mean, I was exposed to so many phenomenal leaders and other soldiers that, I mean, I looked, I did a tour previous to that with guys that were, you know, did the combat jump into Iraq. And I always looked at the guys that came before me and was like, I'm never going to be as good at that as they are. Um, and certainly they all impacted me whether it's Sergeant Kaler, who was killed um, in January of that year. Uh, I think back on previous commanders that I had, such as uh, Major Riggerberg and Sergeant Major, first Sergeant at the time, but first Sergeant Burzak, Sergeant Major Burzak now. Um, other platoon sergeants, I mean, just everybody that I've ever served with, and not even just leaders, peers and, and subordinates. I, I mean, I think that's something that Sergeant Kaler taught me was that you know, good ideas can come from anywhere. You can learn anything. You can learn valuable information from anyone. Um, so when I think about the battle like that, I, th I feel like every leader I ever had or everybody I ever served with was there with us. Do you have any plans to uh, place the Medal of Valor in, on display at your house, or what do you think you might do with it? I haven't given that any thought. I'm taking it one day at a time. I think I'm a, I am a lifetime member of the VFW. Uh, I am joined the American Legion. I'm a member of the uh, 173rd Airborne Association. This might be getting a little ahead of ourselves too, but have you thought about what you might tell Lucas when the time comes about that, about that day? I don't want to tell him about you know, my experiences I want to tell him about what the other guys did. I mean, he's going to grow up knowing, you know, some of the men that were there with me that day. I still keep in very close touch with some of them. Um, and, you know, I want him to know that he's here because of their actions. It's the only reason he's here, because, you know, a lot of those guys saved my life. And there's probably a lot of other men that wouldn't be here if it weren't for them and their actions. You know, guys like Lieutenant Brostrom and, Corporal Hovader, and, you know, everybody at the OP, um, and a lot of other men, too, that did come home. It's not an understatement when I say Valor was everywhere. You talked about how it was Sergeant Garcia and his dying words, and about talking to his mother. He wanted you to talk to his mother and his wife. Did you end up doing that, and what was that like? I... I was able to speak with uh, Leslie Garcia and Mari Cruz. 
when I, I went back to uh, Italy for the return ceremonies. And it was certainly emotionally challenging, but I owed it to him. And I'm glad that I was able to carry out you know, his, his last wishes. And that you know, what was really important is that his family knew that he was thinking of him in his last moments and that he loved him. Not anything to do with my level of discomfort. nominee, but um, it's incredible. It's amazing. How do you feel about this whole experience? Uh, it's overwhelming. Um, we're taking it day by day. We'll go through it, all of it together and take it in stride. Jonathan Ayers, Corporal Jason Bogar, First Lieutenant Jonathan Brostrom, Sergeant Israel Garcia, Corporal Jason Ovader, Corporal Matthew Phillips, Corporal Pruitt Rainey, and Corporal Gunners Welling. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for, for coming here today and taking an interest in, in our story, and it certainly is our story, not mine. This award belongs to every man that was there that day. And I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for, for them. And it was the honor of my lifetime to serve with them. Thank you.